think Robbie just said, it's page 1011 in your pew Bibles. During those days, another large crowd gathered. Since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will collapse on the way because some of them have come a long distance. His disciples answered, but where is this remote place that anyone get, can get enough bread to feed them? How many loaves do you have? Asked Jesus. Seven, they replied. He told the crowd to sit down on the ground. Then he had taken the seven loaves and given thanks. He broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people, and they did so. They had a few small fishes as well. He gave thanks for them also and told the disciples to distribute them. The people ate and were satisfied. Afterwards, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. About 4,000 men were present, and having sent them away, he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the region of Dalamantha. The Pharisees came and began to question Jesus to test him. They asked him for a sign from heaven. He sighed deeply and said, why does this generation ask for a miraculous sign? I tell you the truth, no sign will be given to it. Then he left them. He got back into the boat and crossed to the other side. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful. Jesus warned them, watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed with one another and said, is it because we have no bread? Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many, how many full basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered, seven. Do you still not understand? The healing, oh, sorry, I have the blind man. They came to Bathsheba. And some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and held out, held and led him outside the village. When he had spat on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, Do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people that look like trees and walking around. Once again, Jesus put his hands on the eyes, man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home, saying, don't go into the village. Jesus and his disciples went on to the village called Cassiria Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Christ. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Advert. Keep open Mark chapter 8. I'm going to say a little prayer, and then we've got a video to watch. Our loving Father, again, we ask that you'd speak to us as we come to your word and show us Jesus Christ in his name. Amen. Can you relate to this? It's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me and I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head and it's relentless and I don't know if it's gonna stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever gonna stop. 
Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there... Stop would... trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing... You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. Yeah, well, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, you're out. not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just... Sometimes it's like there's this achy... I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. Yeah, I, that sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on. Ow. If you would just don't try to see things my way. Do I have to keep on talking till I can go? Excuse the slight sexism in that video. And I know that not all marriages or relationships work like that, but can you relate to something like that? That sense of feeling like you missed the wood for the trees. Sometimes, I've noticed some people in the congregation do this, I do it as well, you put your glasses on top of your head or you leave them somewhere and you think, where are my glasses, where are my glasses? And somebody says, they're literally right there on your forehead. When you see the thing that is right in front of your eyes is the thing that you cannot see. Can you relate to something like that? It's a little bit like what's going on in Mark chapter 8. For the first, we'll do the first half this week and think a bit more about the next half of the chapter next week. But as we get to this point in Mark's gospel, if you've been tracking through us, it's kind of the climax. All the way through, we've been thinking, who is this man Jesus? These incredible miracles, the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, the people who just drop everything to follow him. Who is Jesus? Why has he come? What does it mean to follow we're about to get all three questions answered at the very heart of Mark's gospel, the hinge on which it all turns. Peter, his disciple, in verse 28, is asked, 29, what about you? Who do you say that I am? It's the million dollar question. Who is Jesus and who is he to you? But what's funny about this chapter is that the very people who should see what is going on are the people that miss it. Jesus is right in front of their eyes. And I think there's lots for us to learn because if even the disciples can miss what Jesus is actually like, then we'll need to pay attention too. As we started the chapter, I wonder if you've got a bit of a sense of deja vu. If you've been with us for the last few weeks, this story of feeding 4,000 people with just a few loaves of bread, it's quite familiar, isn't it? Literally a couple of chapters earlier, in chapter 6, Jesus feeds not 4,000, but 5,000 people. And there are loads of similarities between these two miracles. There's a huge crowd. Jesus, verse 2, has compassion on them. He loves them. The disciples are a bit confused about where they're supposed to get food from. They're in this remote place. Jesus asks the exact same question, verse 5. How many loaves do you have? They have slightly fewer this time, just seven. But even there's fish, verse, um, verse 7. They had a few small fish as well, as if to really ram it home. This is a very similar miracle. Everybody eats, everybody's satisfied, there are leftovers, and then they get into a boat. Deja vu. That's interesting. Some people think this is just Mark, some silly first century writer, getting a bit confused about two different traditions. This is the kind of thing that makes the Gospels feel very made up. But actually, that's not what's happening at all. Mark is a master storyteller. Verse 18 and 19, even Jesus himself refers to both miracles. They both happened. They're actually in completely different places. We're still in the region of the Gentiles, people who are not the Jewish people, those outside of Israel. It's almost as if here, even outside the boundaries of Israel, Jesus does an amazing thing to invite anybody who would believe. His kingdom is open for everybody. But there's more to it even than that. They're two of the most classic miracles that Jesus could perform, feeding thousands of people. They're really public. And yet both are deeply misunderstood. 
maybe I was thinking about this this week, maybe the reason he does it twice is because just like the thick-headed disciples, we really need to get it into our head as to who Jesus is. There's still something that we don't really see. We're going to look at three things. The blindness of the Pharisees, the blindness of the disciples, and then the cure for spiritual blindness as we get to the end of our little reading. We'll start with the blindness of the Pharisees. Look down at verse 11. This amazing miracle has just happened. And the Pharisees came and began to question Jesus. To test him, they asked him for a sign from heaven. He sighed deeply. Now we've been thinking about this. The Pharisees, you often think, oh, boo, hiss, the Pharisees. They're the kind of baddies of the gospel. But in the original context, they should have been the people who understood who Jesus was. They're the religious ones who know the Bible really well. They've been waiting for the Jewish Messiah. They are looking for all the signs. They're in church every Sunday. They give their money away. They're the community contributors. And yet they don't see what is right in front of their face. They ask him for a sign from heaven. And you think, okay, come on, Jesus, just show them. Just give them a bit of evidence that you're actually God. But the thing is, he's given so many signs They've seen plenty of evidence. The problem is that they refused to believe. They were there when he healed the paralyzed man, but they accused him of blasphemy. They were there in the synagogue when he healed the leper, but they set it up as a test to trap him. There is something in their attitude towards Jesus that stops them from seeing. It's not about the lack of evidence. And I think this is really instructive. How many times have you had a conversation like this with a friend or a family member who says, oh, if I'd have been there, then maybe I'd have believed. If Jesus would just show up my life right now and show me some evidence, then sure, maybe I could believe that he's God. Maybe that's the kind of thing that you've even said yourself. But the Pharisees were there. They never deny the miracles. They still don't believe in Jesus. I think it gives us real pause for thought. Because let's be honest, if that is you, if you're sitting in church this morning and you're thinking, I don't really believe this, just show me the evidence, then can I gently ask, is there any evidence that really could persuade you? Or like these guys, have you already decided not to believe? That's certainly the case for these Pharisees in verse 11. To test him, oh, they, they, they came and began to question Jesus. Now, look, questions are not a bad thing. It's great to ask questions and to think and to pursue what Jesus, who Jesus is and, and, and to ask questions about him. But we all know the difference, right, between questioning someone and asking a question. For these guys, their attitude blinds them. Maybe they refuse to believe because this isn't a Messiah on their terms. It's not what they expect. Maybe they refuse to believe because he's claiming some authority over their lives. They're, he's their Lord. Maybe they refuse to believe because Jesus has come to save and it involves owning up to what they're really like. Whatever it is, whenever they see evidence, it just confirms them in their bias. Verse 12, no sign will be given to this generation. It's not that he stops doing miracles. He just, he's about to do the thing that is most persuasive of all. He's about to rise from the dead after three days. The greatest sign But the irony is that this generation, the generation he's talking about, won't believe it. They miss God himself even when he shows up, even though he's right there in front of them. That's the blindness of the Pharisees. But the disciples, too, are blind. Verse 14, they get back in the boat, verse 13, and then verse 14, the disciples had forgotten to bring bread, except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. And Jesus warns them, be careful. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. Now, in this little section of Mark, there's a lot of getting in and out of boats. I don't know if you've noticed that. And there are three boat incidents that particularly stand out. In chapter 4, the disciples get into a boat with Jesus, and there's this huge storm. And with a word, he calms it. But his disciples are freaked out. They say, chapter 4, verse 41, who is this man that even the wind and the waves obey him? 
boat number two in chapter six, again, there's a huge storm. Jesus this time isn't with his disciples, but he walks out to them on the lake. And again, they're terrified. Is it a ghost? What's going on? They still don't understand. And here, this third boat incident, there's another amazing miracle. They're back in the boat, but they still don't see who Jesus is. He's just done something amazing with bread, but track through and spot how many times the bread theme comes up again. They'd forgotten to bring bread, verse 14, except one loaf they had. Verse 15, watch out for yeast, that's another bread metaphor. Verse 16, it's because we have no bread. Verse 17, why are you talking about having no bread? Don't you see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many basketfuls did you pick up? Verse 20, when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls? Do you still not understand? He's just done an amazing miracle to do with bread. And the disciples are confused because they think he's telling them off for not having a packed lunch. It's ridiculous, isn't it? This is the nail in the forehead. It's the glasses on your head. And you might have some sympathy with the disciples. When they... Jesus calms the storm and they're like, who is this guy? That's hard to get your head around. Their friend is God. Plus, uh, in, in the sort of second boat, when he walks across the water, again, it's kind of scary. People don't normally walk on water. But here, our sympathy for the disciples has waned, hasn't it? I mean, come on, guys. Are you so stupid? Can you not see who Jesus really is? And if that's the question we're asking, then Mark, the brilliant storyteller, turns the finger back on us and says, well, hey, what about you? What about you, 21st century reader? What do you make of Jesus? What about you sitting in church 2,000 years later in Lincoln? If this is what Jesus is like, if this is really what he's like, then doesn't it change everything? This isn't just for those who are investigating Jesus and trying to work out whether or not he's true. It's for Christians too. Remember, these are the disciples. They've been with him for the whole time. And he warns them, watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and Herod. Now, yeast is a powerful metaphor. I, I'm not very good at baking, but from what I understand, if you put a little bit of that dried yeast stuff into dough as you're making it, then it transforms the dough. It kind of makes it grow and, and, and become the kind of dough that you need to actually make bread or pizza or whatever you're making. Even just a little bit will totally transform. And that's the image here. Just a little bit of the attitude of the Pharisees. Just a little bit of the attitude of Herod. Do you remember him from a few years, a few, um, a few chapters ago? He wanted to believe, but it was the peer pressure of everybody else that just turned him off Jesus. They're the obvious negative examples in Mark's gospel of what the opposite of faith is. And the point is, even the disciples can succumb to the same temptations. It doesn't look as serious. They're not plotting to kill Jesus like Herod and the Pharisees. But he's saying, watch out, because you can make the exact same mistake. You can get Jesus wrong. I wonder if their issue is less arrogance or peer pressure or whatever. It's just distraction. They're so obsessed with the thing that's right in front of their face, whether or not they've got lunch. It's because we have no bread, they said. And they missed the wood for the trees. There's um, a brilliant little book by C.S. Lewis called The Screw Tape Letters. I wonder if anyone's come across it. It's a hard sort of concept to get your head around, but what he does is basically pretend to be a devil writing letters to his boss about how to persuade Christians to step away from Jesus, to walk away from God. So in the letter, um, you have to imagine that it's one devil writing to another devil. And the kind of older devil gives some advice to the younger devil about distraction. It's really interesting because I think it's a real insight into how it works. The older devil says, you'll say that that's a very small sin. And doubtless, like all young tempters, you'll be anxious to report spectacular wickedness. You've brought your Christian into a horrible life. But do remember this, the only thing that matters is the extent to which you separate the man from the enemy. He's talking about God. It doesn't matter how small the sins are, 
provided that their cumulative effect is just to edge the man away from the light and out into the nothing. Murder is no better than cards. He's writing in the 50s. It's no better than cards if cards can do the trick. Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. I personally find that a deeply challenging little section of that book. And this is a challenging passage, isn't it? If we really saw who Jesus was, if we really got it, it would change everything in our lives. We'd say, Lord, our life is yours. But how often is it that we miss the most important thing because we're worried about the six inches in front of our face. We're like, I did this the other day. We're like the person walking down the street with your eyes in your phone who completely misses the other person walking the other way. The blindness of the Pharisees, the blindness of the disciples, but then amazingly, the cure for spiritual blindness. They came to Bethsaida, verse 22, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he'd spat on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see tree, people, and they look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home saying, don't go into the village. It's kind of obvious, the link, isn't it? You've got all this spiritual blindness. No one can really see what's going on. And then suddenly, Jesus heals a blind man. He is the one who can open the eyes of our hearts, who can soften hard interiors, who can save the most arrogant sinner, the most peer pressure, fear of man individual, the most distracted disciple. But it's strange, isn't it? The miracle's strange because I don't know if you noticed, it kind of happens in two stages. What's going on? Is Jesus having an off day? Is he just not able to do it the first time? Does he kind of miss fire? I wonder if there's a little mirror here of the disciples' own understanding. We'll come on to Peter's confession of Christ next week. But it happens also in two stages. He gets who Jesus is. You're the Christ. But then Jesus says, okay, now let me tell you what Christs are for. Let me tell you that messiahs come to die. Let me tell you that following you, following me, sorry, is taking up your cross and bearing it like I did. And that is the point that Peter gets cross. <laughs> Step behind me, sees Satan, Jesus says to him. We'll again look at it next week. Jesus, it takes a miracle to open the blind and hard hearts of even people like us. But Jesus is able to do it. His eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. He is the Lord, the one who calls the shots on our lives. He is the Savior, the one who came to earth precisely because we cannot do without him. And it makes all the difference in the world. So as we close, just two little things of application. If, like me, and I'm, I... I I'm preaching to myself here. If, if you recognize yourself in the pride of the Pharisees or the fear of man of someone like King Herod or the just day-to-day -day distraction of the disciples being drawn away from Jesus, if you're like me and you see yourself in that, then remember that he can open the eyes of our hearts. Come back to him. It might take time. It might, you know, might need a bit of patience. But he is able to help us see. And if you're Here's the second thing, concerned or, or, or longing for someone that you know and love to come to see Jesus who, as he actually is. Perhaps you're thinking ahead to the Christmas season and, and wanting to invite someone to something at church this Christmas because you think, oh, the sort of opportunity's there. Then the thing that will help them to see is Jesus opening blind eyes. It's exactly what he does. As the word of God is opened, as the spirit reveals us, reveals what we're like to ourselves, softens hard hearts, unstops blocked ears, and opens blind eyes. It should drive us to our knees, I think, shouldn't it, for those around us whom we long to see Jesus.
take a few moments of silence and I'll say a prayer and we'll carry on with our service. Lord, you know our hearts. You know my heart. So often we struggle to see the thing that is right in front of our face. But thank you that Jesus has compassion on the crowd, that he opens the eyes of the blind, that he's patient with his disciples. And we pray, Lord, that you'd teach us to see you more clearly, to love you more dearly, and to follow you more nearly. In Jesus' name, amen.